Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone uh, to today's webinar. And I wanna thank you for joining us online. Sorry, we can't be together in person this time. However, many of you are in other parts of the country, maybe the world, and we very much appreciate you tuning in. Uh, I'm Neil Lane, Senior Fellow in Science Technology Policy at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. Today's event, titled Scientists Developing Policy, Views from the White House Office of Science Technology Policy. It's a collaboration between the Baker Institute of Science and Technology Policy Program and the student group Rice Science Policy Network. Funding for the event, as well as the Science and Technology Policy Civic Scientist Series, was generously provided by a gift from Winifer and Benjamin Chang, as well as sponsorship from Rice's Weiss School of Natural Sciences and Brown School of Engineering. In addition, we're funded through grants from the Kavli Foundation and the National Science Foundation. Before we start, I want to thank the Baker Institute staff, including Flora Naylor, Macy Stewart, and Daniel Morali, who organized today's event, as well as members of the Rice Science Policy Network, including Adam Navarra. Our discussion today focuses on the role of scientists in shaping policy and how to effectively communicate science policy to relevant stakeholders. The Office of Science and Technology Policy serves as an essential mechanism in ensuring that science is used to make informed policy decisions at the federal level. Let me say a word more about the Office of Science Technology Policy or OSTP as it's known in Washington's world of acronyms since I was once privileged to serve as director. OSTP is actually a small federal agency with its own budget. It's located within the White House complex and its director currently, Dr. Eric Lander, serves as science and technology advisor to the president and sits on the cabinet for the first time, I might say, in history. OSTP is actually the only place in the entire federal government where the focus is on all of science and technology and the myriad ways it impacts all our lives and underpins pretty much everything the federal government does. Some of the most pressing issues facing our nation, climate change, the continued COVID-19 pandemic, and future ones, and rampant spread of misinformation, cyber threats from many directions, and, and others require science-informed policies to secure effective solutions. Our speaker today, who will be introduced in a moment, is an experienced communicator at the science policy interface. We very much look forward to hearing her perspective on the role of scientists in molding policy at a federal level. Introducing our speaker and moderating our question and answer session this afternoon is a member of the Rice Science Policy Network, an intern in the Baker Institute Developing Civic Scientist Leaders Program, and a Rice graduate student in chemistry, Jordan Metz. Jordan and his colleagues created the Rice Science Policy Network last summer to bring together Rice graduate students and undergraduates interested in policy and engagement. As an intern in the Developing Civic Scientist Leaders Program, he's helped raise awareness with policymakers on the importance of funding basic research. He also has published several opinion articles through the Baker Institute blog this year, discussing changes in environmental policy in the Biden administration and encouraging scientists to regain the joy and wonder of science despite the chaos of the past year caused by the pandemic. Jordan is one of those amazing students who just seem to be able to do it all. So Jordan, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lane. I really appreciate that. Uh, now I'd really like to introduce uh, today's main speaker, Dr. Gretchen Goldman. Dr. Gretchen Goldman is currently serving as the Assistant Director for Environmental Science, Engineering, Policy, and Justice at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. She is currently on leave from her position as Research Director for the Center for Science and Democracy at the Union of Concerned Scientists. For the last decade, Dr. Goldman worked on research efforts combining science and policy at the Union of Concerned Scientists exploring topics including federal scientific integrity, fossil energy production, climate change, and environmental justice. We're thrilled to have Dr. Goldman here today to present on the role of scientists in shaping policy and how to effectively communicate science policy to relevant stakeholders. 
science policy is particularly relevant today when issues such as COVID-19 and climate change pose huge global and local challenges and require science-driven policy solutions. We look forward to hearing about Dr. Goldman's journey to working in the White House and her experience as a scientist working in federal policy spaces. We'll begin today's webinar with a short presentation by Dr. Goldman. Afterwards, we'll open up the conversation with some questions prepared in advance, as well as from the audience. So for those attending today, please feel free to submit questions in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And you can do these Q&A questions uh, during the remarks or afterwards when we're in the Q&A session. Please try and keep your questions short to just a couple of lines. And remember that you can upvote questions in the Q&A box. Now, without further ado, Dr. Gretchen Goldman. Thank you so much, Jordan. I am so excited to be here with you today and be able to talk with you. Uh, I have some brief opening remarks and slides, and then I will look forward to the broader discussion. All right, so first off, I'd say this is me. Uh, testifying at the FDA uh, early on in my career. And at this event, I was one of two scientists that gave public comment at this hearing, uh, even though this was a science policy uh, proposal. And it was about uh, adding to the nutrition facts label a line on added sugars, which you'll now see on uh, all of the food and drink packaging that you consume. And this is a rule that now is expected to prevent nearly a million cases of cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes and save tens of billions of dollars in healthcare costs. So the point I want to make here is that we can get these huge benefits for society when we have evidence-based policy, but we can only get there if scientists show up, if scientists are willing to engage in that policy process, and then the possibilities are endless. So uh, before I got any further, and we can we can go dive into these in more detail in our discussion, but I wanted to lead with this so that if you get nothing else from the talk today, that you uh, get this, which is that there are many, many ways to engage in science policy discussions. Uh, and these, there's this broad spectrum, and it really uh, can vary depending on your skills and your interest and your, your position in uh, the world. And so um, there is lots of ways to engage, no matter what your job is, no matter your career stage and, and no matter what you prefer in terms of engagement. And so uh, to give you a sample of what these look like, there's formal science advice. And these, these are committees that exist at the local, state, and federal levels where you can advise decision makers on science and technology related topics. There's public comments. Uh, you can provide written or orally at, at all levels of government. There's meeting with decision makers directly and often uh, decision makers, uh, both on, on the executive and legislative sides and at all levels of government are often really excited to hear from a technical expert, uh, especially if you have a, a local connection to an issue. Uh, and there's the way of uh, engaging with the media. And so this is sort of an indirect uh, policy engagement opportunity to really make sure that when, when science and technology topics are covered in the news, uh, that they're covered accurately and that they're communicated in a way that the broader public can understand uh, the science and technology dimensions and implications of, uh, of different news stories. And so this is a huge way that, that can be crucially important. Uh, and that includes, um, you taking the step of writing op-eds or letters to the editor and other ways of engaging with the media. And as a scientist and, and uh, other technical experts, we can conduct policy relevant research, um, ask what, what key policy questions can my research help answer? Because um, these might or might not always align with, with what is scientifically interesting in an academic context. Um, and you can you can do a lot of public engagement, educate the public, uh, show yourself as a citizen scientist in various ways, and you can plug into civil society organizations. So if you're interested in some of these things, but you don't have uh, the time or expertise to know where to look for policy opportunities, uh, you can look for groups that are doing this work and thinking about it, and they would love to have more people engaged and plugged into the, the work that they're anyway doing around a policy topic. And so uh, definitely look for that. 
Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't uh, give you an immediate opportunity to apply those ways to engage in science policy. Uh, so I wanted to flag this current challenge that the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy has open around advancing equity in science and technology. Um, so this is a, a challenge.gov initiative where we are looking for ideas about how to advance equity uh, in science and technology fields, uh, given a lot of challenges that we know exist and a lot of inequities that currently exist and who has access to uh, science and technology and who has the ability to thrive in those in those fields. And so this is a challenge that's open for a few more days. Uh, so you have some time to submit something if you have any ideas that would be of interest. And so backing up a little further, the mission of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, uh, where I am, is to maximize the benefits of science and technology to advance health, prosperity, security, environmental quality, and justice for all Americans. And so we're really sitting in this unique place and we're in the White House, in the executive offices. Um, so really thinking about, you know, what are the political priorities of the administration um, while also being being able to connect to the scientific community to be really thinking about where science and technology is and where it's going um, and how best can we ensure that policy is uh, meeting the challenges that science and technology um, can help answer. Uh, and so I wanted to highlight some of the ways that this administration is thinking about that. And so uh, in the Biden-Harris administration, uh, you may have heard a big theme is, is building back better. Uh, so we really feel like this is a moment to reimagine and rebuild an American economy for our families and the next generation. Uh, and science and technology absolutely have a huge role to play in that. Uh, and another huge priority is tackling the climate the climate crisis. Uh, the US and the world face this profound climate crisis, but we can listen to the science and, uh, and science and technology are a big part of the solutions to that problem. And so uh, there's lots of ways for, for technical experts to engage in that in those efforts. And, and lastly, there's, a, there's also a huge priority within the Biden-Harris administration on advancing racial and gender equity. Uh, and I want to note this because uh, this is uh, very emphasized and elevated in the White House in, in ways that it hasn't been previously. And so this is uh, a pretty big deal. And the administration's thinking about advancing equity and civil rights and racial justice and equal opportunity. Uh, and the administration's view is that in order to do that, we really need a whole of government approach. And so it, it cannot be, you know, side programs that focus on equity, but it really needs to be integrated across the government and all the work that we do. Uh, and so I wanted to highlight um, some science informed policy that was uh, implemented this week. And so uh, the bipartisan infrastructure deal, which the president signed uh, this week is, um, has many components in, of it that were informed by uh, science and technical experts. And I wanna highlight this because we would not get the huge benefits that we're seeing in that bill that will bolster Americans, America's competitiveness, resilience, and an economy that creates good paying jobs, saving people money and building an equitable clean energy economy for the future. And we absolutely would not get all of those things if scientists and technical experts, both in and outside of the government, hadn't chosen to engage in policy and really inform that process. Uh, and so a few of those things are a huge focus on uh, electric vehicles and electrification broadly, uh, access to high speed internet, uh, there's um, investments in, in climate resilience and really thinking about how to protect communities and infrastructure from climate impacts and cyber threats. Uh, and I, I want to call out the public health and environmental justice piece of the of the bill because this has gotten less uh, attention but is uh, actually very significant and, and that's that there's a lot of funding for uh, clean expanding access to clean drinking water and cleaning up uh, legacy pollution. And so this is a, a really big deal, especially for communities that have uh, long been uh, exposed or living ad adjacent to uh, pollution sources uh, that have been there for decades. And this is disproportionately communities of color and low income communities. And so uh, this is a huge opportunity to address many of those inequities. 
Um, and uh, there's huge efforts to um, clean the electricity grid, uh, upgrade power infrastructure, uh, get new transmission lines to facilitate renewable energy and to lower costs for consumers in the bill as well. And so before we get into the discussion, I wanted to make one final point, and that is about the stakes. And what exactly is at stake if scientists choose not to engage in policy decisions? And one real risk of that, and one that's an increasing threat that OSDP is thinking deeply about is uh, the threat of misinformation. Uh, and you heard Dr. Lane speak to this as well, that when scientists and technical experts don't engage in policy decisions, that can leave a void. And that void can be filled with misinformation. And we know from climate change to vaccines that misinformation can have dire consequences for the public. And so the scientific community has this huge role to play in guarding against that misinformation. And it starts with the scientific community insisting on science and evidence-based policy every step of the way. And I look forward to the discussion. All righty. Thank you so much, Dr. Goldman. Really appreciate your fascinating remarks. And now definitely would like to open up to a conversation. So uh, members of the audience, if you have questions that you'd like to ask, uh, remember you can do so using the Q&A window located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please try and keep your questions short and remember that you should be able to upvote questions. We'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible. And so one of the first questions that was, asked here was, I'd like to hear a little more about your, your personal journey. So, so Dr. Goldman, what really interested you in science and particularly the area of science you got your PhD in? And were you always interested in policy as well? Or did that come along a little bit later? Sure. So I, uh, I really, as a, as growing up and in grade school, I always really liked uh, knowing why things happened and understanding uh, cause and effect and, and uh, thinking I really liked history, sort of understanding those dynamics. And I found that drew me to science because uh, that was a really awesome way to learn about how things happen and really understand how the world works. And so um, I decided to go into um, atmospheric science for my undergrad at Cornell. And um, as I as I got further into that, I, I got more interested in environmental issues and some of the societal interactions with uh, the atmosphere in different ways. And uh, so that led me to do uh, air pollution research. Uh, so for graduate school, I switched to environmental engineering and I did some work looking at air pollution exposure and health effects at Georgia Tech. And um, I was working on this really fascinating scientific problem there. We were thinking about you know, exactly uh, what is the connection between pollution levels and uh, the health effects that we observe uh, and what happens, you know, what is the level to which we can even detect that those changes in the atmosphere um, or you know could there be health effects happening that we're not even able to see because of the limitations around the science and, and measurements um, and so it was really fascinating but the more that I, I learned about that issue and the more I sort of got into it the, the more I I felt like the a lot of the challenges around that you know are nothing to do with science they're more about policy and political will and uh, ensuring that um, you know, we, we have uh, decision makers that are armed with the scientific information to actually make change about air pollution. And so um, I found myself increasingly just drawn to those those policy dimensions of the issue. And um, and, I, and I felt like that was a, a good application for a lot of the skill sets that I had developed up until that point. And so uh, I, I came to DC and uh, decided to take that science policy route. And, um, and of course, when I got to DC, I, I met all kinds of people who also had uh, technical PhDs, but we're doing uh, applied work. So science communication or advocacy or uh, policy in different dimensions. And so um, there's a whole world of people here doing those kinds of jobs. And I um, luckily found myself uh, able to uh, get one of those jobs as an analyst at the Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, where I stayed for a, a decade doing that work. Wow, uh, that's awesome. And as someone who's currently working on his PhD, um, but I'm also really interested in, in policy. This is really inspiring to hear about your journey and that you can make that transition. And so I really appreciate you coming here today and, and telling us about your journey. Yeah, it's possible. It's been done. 
<laughs> so uh, can you talk a little bit about the transition from Unit of Concerned Scientists into the White House? And um, given that you're, you're on leave right now from the Unit of Concerned Scientists for a year, is the White House position only a year long? Do you see possibility of extension or to the, the extent that you can talk about that? Love to hear about that. Yeah, sure. It's a good question. And I think this is maybe not uh, as known uh, externally, but uh, I and uh, many people at the Office of Science and Technology Policy are uh, borrowed from other organizations. So there's, they're on detail from uh, either uh, nonprofits like me or from academia or from federal agencies. Uh, and so that's uh, this very unique arrangement that allows for uh, there to be a lot of cross-pollination with different kinds of organizations and you can really bring in expertise um, in different ways. You can bring in people to uh, do work that is very targeted because you can, you can bring someone in for their expertise or, or some specific policy idea or uh, dimensions that they have. And, and so that uh, has allowed OSDP to be really nimble in situations and, and really allow them to um, gain the expertise of people from different places. And so um, that's sort of the arrangement that a lot of people have. And um, I think it's a really good way to get a lot of different kinds of expertise. And so um, so I'm on loan, many people are on loan that way. And so it really allows for um, a big opportunity. And so, um, yeah, we'll see. It's always, it, it, it is temporary, but uh, it'll be um, a good opportunity. Yeah, no, it's great to see that the government is really tapping into our our resources and our nation's brightest minds for advice on solving some of the biggest problems. That's so important. I'm curious uh, to kind of continue on that thread. How has policymaking in the White House differed from your previous work at the Union of Concerned Scientists? This is a good question. And actually, I, in some ways, I've found it uh, less, not, not, not very different. In some ways, it's um, sort of, you're sort of thinking about a lot of the same dimensions about, you know, what is sort of, how do we leverage science and technology to solve this problem, given the constraints about where the science is, but also thinking about what's politically feasible, where's the opportunity, and, and how do we really advance change. And so uh, I, I have largely found it's actually a lot of the same kind of skill sets of, of that kind of strategic thinking and, and uh, that science communication about how do you sort of succinctly describe something that's very technical and complex and, um, you know, and how do you, how do you get it done in sort of a complex political environment? Uh, I think one of the, one of the interesting um, differences is more about, you know, exactly um, how you can get things done and um, where the opportunities are. I think, um, you know, within the government, everything is very collaborative. There's lots of opportunity to work across the government in different ways and OSDP has this uh, great position in, to be able to do that, to really work with uh, people across the government in different federal agencies. You know, you can really tap the expertise of, of people in different places. And so that gives you sort of a new way of getting things done and you, you can you know, gain a lot from all that expertise and, and also coordinate across different parts of the government that are uh, doing different things. And so um, that's probably the biggest difference is that sort of coordination and um, collaboration effort. Yeah, I mean, it's for the members of the audience who aren't as familiar with how science policy structures fit into the government, could you talk a little bit about how OSTP really fits into the federal government overall? And then one of the questions in the chat was also about the relationship between OSTP and Congress. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, it's often um, a black box, I, I think, when you're outside of it. It's not very clear how things <laughs> operate. So, um, so the way that uh, it works is that so um, starting at the top, there is the executive and there is the legislative branches of government, and they are separate. So there is Congress, and they are uh, doing things that pertain to legislation and funding and oversight, and uh, they are independently uh, helping to govern um, the nation. And on the executive side, we have um, there's. Uh, different parts of the government. So there's career staff. So most federal agencies that you can think about, you know, the FDA, the CDC, the EPA, um, lots of lots of alphabet soup, but all of the federal agencies that do a lot of the administration of uh, public services and um, safeguard the American public in different ways, uh, those are largely com comprised of career staff. So people who are public servants, they are not uh, political in their position, and they are uh, 
doing that work. And so there are many, many thousands of technical experts uh, doing, doing that work within agencies and serving the public by applying their technical skills for um, the missions of the agencies, which are generally to protect uh, public health, uh, safety, security, um, et cetera. And so and then uh, on the executive, at the top on the executive is uh, the executive offices of the president. And so the president has um, several exec executive offices that cover different uh, areas. And uh, some of the other ones you might have heard of are the National Security Council or the um, National Economic Council and uh, OSTP or the Office of Science and Technology Policy is one of those executive offices. And so uh, the way that we operate is um, you are, uh, taking uh, taking instructions and a priority direction from uh, the president's office. So thinking about, you know, anything that has come out of an executive order by the president or uh, a memorandum or any other sort of direction that you get from uh, the president and the top staff there, uh, that is what you are implementing as, as they uh, come up. And so, you know, one example is that in this administration, uh, a big priority has been scientific integrity. Uh, and so there are many people at OSTP that are focused on thinking about how to implement that order from the president to uh, get a lot of that done and that involves a lot of working with agencies um, and then there's a lot of um you know, behind the scenes work that pertains to the executive office. So there's a lot of um, committees and, and different working groups and ways that science is coordinated across the government. Um, and some of these activities happen no matter who is in, in power at the top. So it's not a function of who the president is. They're just ongoing uh, science and technology coordination activities. And so um, a lot of that is things that OSTP uh, administers or helps coordinate and um, make sure that there's, there's cohesion and connection across uh, those doing science and technology efforts uh, across the government as well as externally. Wow, thanks for that really comprehensive answer. It sounds like OSTP has a hand in a lot of different pots, and which is really important because science should be uh, really pervasive throughout our, our decision making. Um, in terms of your specific title of for, uh, Assistant Director for Environmental Science, Engineering, Policy and Justice, this is a pretty unique title and it especially links justice with the environment. And so how does the current administration view justice as playing a role in environmental policy? I'm glad you picked up on that because you're right, it is a very uh, unique combination and it's one that really hasn't been done before so much at the, the presidential level. So uh, as I flagged in my opening comments, racial equity is a huge focus of the administration and environmental justice is a big uh, piece of that. And uh, never before has environmental justice been prioritized to the extent that it is in the Biden administration. And so this is a really um, big deal. We're doing a lot of new things and uh, advancing it in ways that it hasn't been done before. And my favorite example of that is uh, the Justice 40 initiative, which is currently underway. And this is an effort to ensure that uh, 40% of the benefits from investments in climate and clean energy that the administration and the government make uh, go to disadvantaged communities. Uh, and so this was done in response to uh, a lot of communication with environmental justice leaders. So people, um, people who have been working on this issue for decades and thinking about you know, these issues of, of inequities and environmental exposure. Uh, and so this is a, a huge effort to try to really think about you know, how do we address that challenge and how do we really um, ensure that the communities that have been burdened uh, for so long with uh, pollution and other environmental stressors um, can now see benefits from a lot of the transition that the nation's making to clean energy and uh, addressing climate change. Uh, and so um, that's, you know, a big way that we're centering environmental justice and, um, and my work and my title is a, is a function of that in thinking about how we really need to um, make sure that we're thinking about equity and uh, in, in all aspects of our work and environmental justice is a place where science and technology really can and should inform how we, how we both, how we address environmental justice and, and also just how we assess it, you know, the degree to which we're able to even um, detect those inequities. Yeah, I mean, environmental justice is, is so important. I'm glad you're doing so much work on that. I'm curious, just as a follow-up for the Justice 40 initiative, um, what kind of work is being done to really publicize this? And you said that, of course, a lot of the work 
uh, in creating the initiative was by asking stakeholders what's needed. But for people who don't know as much about it, what kind of work is being done to really to really get lots of other people on board and make sure that it's really publicly known um, so that kind of the whole country can come together on this, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a great idea. I think um, there's some efforts that have already been made, and I think there's going to be more to come, especially once a lot of the details are more fully implemented. But uh, one piece that I'll say that um, is was really unique and, and was um, a way for the public to engage is the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Committee. So this was uh, a brand new committee of external people that the administration formed. Uh, so it's comprised of environmental justice leaders, uh, people that have thought about this issue and worked in it and, and been community members in, in places that have experienced these issues for many, many decades. And there's a couple scientists on that um, panel as well. And uh, they have been meeting regularly and providing input into the Justice 40 initiative and a few other environmental justice related work that the administration is prioritizing. Um, and so that's been a really unique uh, thing to have an environmental justice focused committee at the White House level that's informing decision making. Uh, and that committee uh, came out with um, recommendations for the administration that are that are public so you can see what they said about what the administration should do and what should be prioritized um, and those meetings were also public and so there was a public comment period as part of all of those meetings and uh, the public people did listen in and, and show up and speak and um, that has been one way that the public is intersected with it and um, but I agree. I think we should we should publicize it more, and especially once we start seeing some of those some of these benefits flow to the communities that need it. Um, it's a it's a huge opportunity that we should take advantage of. Yeah, I mean, I realize the bill just passed in the last week, so there's there's some time. Um, in terms of of justice and diversity, equity, and inclusion, you mentioned that the Biden administration has made you know equity initiatives a really big part of their agenda and that really will help increase innovation and science in America. And I'm wondering, uh, have you talked or have, have you done any work with uh, the approaches that the White House is trying to take to increase diversity and representation specifically in STEM and in the sciences? Yeah, I'm glad you brought this up because this is a big uh, focus and um, OSDP is working on that issue a lot. Um, as um, many of you may be aware, there continues to be uh, inequities in who has access to STEM fields. And uh, we see this at all levels. We see it both at you know who is pursuing STEM degrees uh, and who can stay in that pipeline. And, um, and you see it uh, even more pronounced at uh, higher leadership levels, and, and that's true both within and outside of the government in STEM fields. And so, uh, and this uh, applies to um, both gender equity and, and racial equity and uh, other marginalized identities that people have. We sort of see that, um, you know, we don't quite see the diversity of America reflected in uh, a lot of STEM fields. And even though there's been a lot of efforts to address that over many years, you know, we've seen that, that persistent um, inequity. And so um, the administration's thinking hard about how to address that because, you know, we're sort of seeing that, you know, what, what we've been doing isn't enough. It hasn't solved the problem. And so, you know, where do we need to be looking? What do we need to be doing to really make progress on that? Uh, and so there are efforts uh, within OSDP to both focus um, internally and in, in sort of federal government efforts and who's represented and who has opportunities um, for, for, in the STEM workforce in the government, as well as the broader STEM community and um, education all the way up to, to who stays in the field. Um, and so one thing I would flag about that is uh, the National Science and Technology Council, which is um, a big body that OSDP uh, runs that includes uh, many committees that work on different science and technology um, challenges and one of them is focused one of those subcommittees is focused on uh, inclusion in stem and they are just released a report where they looked at this problem and gathered a lot of input about what works and what doesn't and you know what are the recommendations for what people should do um, and so i would i would encourage folks to check that out um, and it is a, a a good piece of, um, it's a good report that, that highlights a lot of things that uh, academic institutions can do and um, other places that might be, you know, better strategies for getting um, 
getting more representation in the STEM fields. And so um, this is absolutely something that we're looking at and something that uh, we should continue to prioritize. And, um, and if you have any good ideas about that and how we would implement it, please submit them to the science, um, the Sci Equity Challenge that I shared in the presentation earlier, because I think um, we're also looking to hear about, you know, anything that has worked in other places that could be scaled up or, or any new idea that seems um, like it has a lot of promise, even if it hasn't had the opportunity to be implemented. Yeah, thank you for, per, excuse me, thank you for providing a great opportunity for people to engage right away. Um, this is an opportunity for people to just be able to uh, engage with the government right now and share their ideas and hopefully advance equity and great ideas in science and science policy. So coming back to like we're circling back, of course, your, your position is related to environmental justice. And that's a big part of it. Um, but thinking about kind of the whole broad um, you know, portfolio that you have, what are some of your top priorities during your time at OSTT? Yeah, there's a lot of opportunity. I think, um, you know, one thing I learned at OSTP is that uh, there's there's so much uh, good that you can do. There's so many things that uh, need doing and just need uh, someone to focus on them and someone to help facilitate the process. They just need a champion essentially to work on it. And so um, it, it is such an opportunity to think about, you know, what is the, the priority that you want to advance? And so um, the sort of high level priority that I'm, I'm interested in advancing in different ways is making, seeing about how are there better ways that we can leverage science and technology gains to better assess and address inequities in uh, the population. Because we're at this really interesting time where science and technology is expanding really rapidly um, and environmental justice is a place where this is happening a lot, right? Where we have, um, for example, you know, all these new technologies coming online that allow us to see environmental inequities at smaller and smaller spatial and temporal scales. So we have satellites coming online that can really see differences uh, across space uh, better. And we have um, all these low cross ground based sensors and citizen science coming that uh, has a lot of opportunity to really better assess and equip the community with um, being able to see, you know, where are there inequities, who's being exposed to more pollution and who's being exposed to less. And so those are really incredible tools. And as, as the scientific community, right, there's all kinds of neat uh, science and assessments you could do with that. We can make pretty maps, right? We can do all these things, um, but none of that matters unless we can get it into uh, decision-making and really ensure that it informs uh, policy. And so I um, am really interested and thinking about, you know, what what we, what do we need to do to to better bridge that gap and really make sure that as these new technologies come online, that they can be really informing the kinds of decisions that we make as 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 the government, as decision makers. And, you know, you can think about a lot of different ways that that looks, right? It both uh, arms the communities themselves with tools to uh, to sort of see what uh, what they're exposed to. And it also allows um, decision makers to use that information to ensure they're doing the most good for the public. And they can work to address those inequities. Um, they can prioritize communities that are that are more disproportionately affected. And, um, you know, and there's lots of ways that you can we can think about that. But that's that's one area where I I think there is a lot of um, opportunity uh, for us to make gains. Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate you really hammering home saying we need the technology, but we also need that to be supported by policy. And without that connection, uh, we're not going to make the advances we need to, at least not quickly enough. And so we've gotten some questions in the chat related to that saying, you know, a lot of professionals and other scientists, you know, that are doing some of this technology work and innovation often feel unprepared to address or contribute to policy formation. And so I'm curious, given your vast amount of experience, what's the best or, or a, number, a collection of some of the you know, best ways or top tips that you found that to boost people's confidence when doing this type of public speaking or public engagement? 
Yeah, it's a really good question because, and I think, um, you know, first I'll just say, if you feel like that, it's not your fault, right? Our, our education as scientists and all of the uh, feedback we get about what's important and where we should prioritize is not those things, right? We aren't really taught to think about public communication and ensure that our writing is accessible and, you know, all of these things that are crucially important if you want to do policy relevant science, but, um, you know, the, we just haven't had, we, we don't have a system that really prioritizes or rewards that effort. And so, um, so first I would say, you know, you don't have to feel like um, you missed out. I think, um, you know, it's, it's a, we're, we're um, victims of that, that structure, but um, given that there are lots of uh, tools and, and ways to get up to speed and, and things that you can do to really think about um, better prepare yourself for that. So uh, there's lots of um, nonprofits that do different um, scientist engagement communication efforts. And um, so I would definitely and look for those and get plugged into resources. There's a lot of webinars about um, science communication and advocacy and policy that have helped um, me and, and um, gotten me to think harder about that. Um, and more generally, I would say another sort of big um, piece of that is just to practice and uh, get do more things that are public facing because um, again you know you're probably you're not necessarily doing that in your, in your day job as a scientist or aspiring scientist um, but if you can find opportunities to really uh, challenge you to do that I think that's really um, an important way you can do that so you know one example is just to just to do blogs to write blogs to write tweets to do things where uh, think about how you would communicate things publicly and getting that experience and and doing it even if it's uh, outside of your comfort zone initially I think can give go a lot of a lot of ways and um and, and I think too as as scientists we're we're sort of hard on ourselves right because we think we're, we're looking for perfection in terms of how we write something or say something but in a lot of these contexts it's not that you know you don't need to include every complexity of the science as you know it if you want to uh tell a decision maker that you care about something and you want them to address it. And, you know, I think it's sort of hard for um, many of us to let go of the, those details that we really know and like and understand that we want to make sure everyone else knows that we understand them. Um, but a lot of times, you know, we can, we really can force, can step away from that and that can be very effective. Um, and so um, I don't, so people shouldn't feel like they need to be sort of an expert um, smooth talker to be able to be um, in a policy setting and, and communicate effectively. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, um, I'm curious. So another question in the class in the in the chat was, is a you know should it be a matter of science policy to actually increase scientists' ability to engage and talk to the public? Mm, that's a good. Uh, that is a good question. So I think that gets into a lot of the need for us to make policy more accessible to people and make science policy more accessible to people because. You know, in many ways, that, of course, is a big barrier. You know, if you look at um, rules and the way you do written public comments is through at the federal level is through the federal register, which, um, you know, we uh, it was recently updated and there's there's sort of efforts to make it more accessible uh, all the time. You know, but for a lot of people like that in and of itself is a barrier because that's not a Web page that the average person is opening up every day. And, you know, people aren't sort of read regularly reading the federal register. And if they did, you know, it might not be that clear uh, what is a relevant opportunity and what isn't because if things are of course, written um, uh, to, to, for different audiences, right? And they're written to be legally compliant and meet all these other recommendations and standards. And so um, I think there is a big opportunity for um, making sure that we, are, we do have things that are accessible to scientists and, uh, and that scientists know to do that. And uh, so I think that's, that's both sort of on the government side, that's a, a, a good way for us to think about, you know, how do we make things more accessible and how do we ensure that people can engage? Um, and I think it's also a, a big opportunity on um, the scientist side and what our, our mentors and professors and people that have um, influence over the scientific community broadly, our scientific societies, I'd put in that bucket of, um, bridging that gap and putting things in front of people that they can contribute to. Um, and I know there's a lot of scientific societies and institutions that that do this well. Um, but I think that's the other way that we can do, we can um, really expand uh, access to scientists because, you know, I think a lot of people, um, 
clearly Jordan, you and uh, your colleagues at and um, at Rice are very interested in and in choosing to pursue science policy and and, and think about it and, and expose yourself to those topics and um, and think about it deeply. But um, a lot of scientists that are just trying to finish their PhDs or get their work done, you know, it might not be um, on people's radar, you know, and that's um, uh, that that's where there's an opportunity to um, as leaders in the scientific community, you know, what can we do to expose people to that so you know in the classroom can 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 anyone who's teaching say, you know, this was in the news this week, here's that relate, here's that, how that relates to what we are learning in the classroom. Um, and even those, the little things like that um, can have a big impact, at least I know they did on me when, um, when I was in class and, and professors would sometimes say, you know, this happened and here's what that means and how that relates because, um, you know, a lot of times uh, we're not otherwise getting that in STEM education. I'm curious, because do you think there's any opportunity for more systemic change as well? Like right now, the academic environment and you know, the way that grants are structured often don't reward uh, science policy work, especially like at least in academia and for industry, although I'm not in industry, you know, a lot of stuff has to be kept behind, you know, as, as you know, secret stuff so that you don't share uh, technologies with competitors and stuff. So do you know if there's any work that OSTP could do to help shift policy for science? that would create an academic environment that rewards and promotes these activities as a core part of doing research? Yeah, that's absolutely a good, a good concept to think about. I think uh, there's a lot of opportunity for that, you know, certainly in grant making, right? There's a lot of opportunities for changing how, how grants are written and what kinds of, um, what are we what are we looking for what sorts of um, requests for proposals are put out there right we can ask different kinds of research questions that are more policy relevant or that you know get at some of these things or um, you know there's of course uh, NSF has the broader impacts uh, question on a lot of their grants and that's an option to um, you know, for that's an opportunity for people to say what they are doing in a lot of uh, on a lot of these issues but uh, that there's so much more that we could do and that um, anyone who's giving grants, both, um, you know, both government side and uh, other sort of private sector grants, I think that's a, that's a huge way to think about it and how do we sort of incentivize it in different ways. Um, so that that is something that OSTP is thinking about and I think there is a lot of um, there. And if you have a spe specific idea, you should of course submit it to the <laughs> Science Equity Challenge. Thanks for plugging that again. I, I wanna, switch gears a little bit. There's been a number of questions in the chat related to um, science communication and then also misinformation, which you highlighted in your remarks. And so you said that when scientists don't engage in civil society, it can leave a void for misinformation. Um, but over the last couple of years, we have seen a lot of talk about science. Science has actually really been in the spotlight with COVID and especially recently COP26 climate change. Um, and there's still often or even more a lot of misinformation or misinformation getting highlighted and claims of fraud and vaccine conspiracies and all these things. And so how can or how should scientists really operate to make a difference in this kind of oversaturated reality that we live in right now? Yeah, this is the challenge. It's it's not um, <laughs> easy, it. <laughs> and uh, I you know I wish it could be solved by a s scientist just stepping and saying, and you know, well, actually, it's this. But uh, of course, it's much more uh, complex of a challenge than that. And so, um, yeah, so I, I think there's there's a lot. This is a big um, thing that OSDP is thinking about too. Is sort of you know what can we do about this misinformation uh, ecosystem that that people are getting information from and how can you, um, you know, really think about how to fight it because uh, it is such a, it is such a growing and complex challenge. So I think as scientists, um, you know, of course, as individuals, we have limited roles in this. Um, but one thing I always think about is, um, well, a couple of things. So, so one is at the individual level, we have uh, power to influence people around us. And so um, there's a lot of evidence that says, you know, people are most uh, persuadable on topics if someone they trust uh, tells them. And so um, that's a huge opportunity for anyone in your in your personal life or professional life that you that you know personally and can um, explain the correct science, and so you know that's that's sort of an ongoing um, uh, 
task we all can help with. And, um, and then I'd also just say, uh, I think there is a lot of, uh, so, you know, the, the, as a scientist, you are, you are, have a limited ability to affect some of the broader challenges of, you know, uh, misinformation generating machines on the internet and, and things that are, are going to be out there no matter what we do. Um, but there is a, a lot of potential in different settings to be influential. And so one that occurs to me is around uh, informing the media on a topic. And so um, my in my former role, I would often um, get a call from a reporter. And sometimes they would want to talk about something that I felt like I didn't have, you know, a tremendous level of expertise on, but I knew some things. Um, but it was helpful to talk with them because if, if a reporter is, is looking for information, they are in good faith looking for someone who can explain it to them. And uh, if they don't get to talk to a scientist, if they don't get to talk to someone who has uh, some technical expertise on a topic, you know, that, that sort of risks, they, they might not have as much context as they need to really give a science-informed article. And, and they have the ability to educate uh, broadly the public um, about that. And so I think that's one place where um, we can be influential is just, um, you know, to the extent we have opportunities to talk with people that will that have a platform to share things with more people to really um, make sure they have the, the technical knowledge that they need. And, um, and so there's, um, because, you know, there's of course, um, many bad faith actors in on the misinformation space. Um, but there's also a lot of people that are uh, sincerely looking for information and they are Googling things and they are just trying to understand uh, what, what the reaction to something is. And so, um, you know, in the, for those people, I think it is very helpful that when they Google it, they find a science answer, right? They don't just find the misinformation. And so if scientists say, you know, I don't want to engage on that, or that I don't want to get involved in that, then, um, you know, that there might not be a, a scientific response to an article. And so there's lots of um, opportunities in sort of um, small settings like that to really be influential. Yeah, thanks for your answer. This is obviously a huge problem, and you're not the only person uh, working to solve it. Um, but I'm curious, kind of zooming out a little bit, in that field, because science has really been in the spotlight so much over the course of the last year and a half, two years, how have you seen science communication itself changing? And what are some lessons you've learned regarding science communication during this time? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I'm sure um, books will be written about uh, the COVID communication challenge and, um, you know, how we all, uh, what we all learned about that, that experience or this experience that we're all still going through in um, educating people about how to stay safe and healthy during a pandemic. And um yeah, I, you know, I think, uh, like many things, there's going to be there's pros and cons, you know, and so in many ways, uh, communication, science communication is is much more democratized than it used to be, right? There's a lot more opportunity to uh, speak as a scientist, and you don't necessarily need to have, you know, a position, a, a title, or um, be in a space that is, um, uh, very senior to to get that opportunity. Um, and so for a lot of people, that's been um, very useful, you know, and there's uh, a lot of people who have, um, you know, really found their voice in being able to explain scientific topics to non-science audi audiences. And, um, and that's really filled a valuable role. I think, um, you know, I think a lot about the people, there's a lot of people on Twitter who have done this on specific topics and, um, and it's proven um, really useful, especially for um, youth education and getting people people aware of things that have ha just happened, you know, if an earthquake happens, there's, uh, there's people to really quickly explain that and, and get that information out there really fast. Um, and that can be really valuable because um, that's something where, you know, there might not otherwise be a, a lot of information really quickly. And uh, if we have sort of crowdsourced science scientists um, uh, weighing in, that can be really helpful. And so, so I think what we learned um, this past year is, is just that, you know, what that sort of what that challenge looks like when it's it's more of a, a science communication challenge like we saw with COVID because you know I think COVID was um, 
of course it's a novel illness and we're all learning about this virus. And so it was an evolving landscape. And so uh, understandably the information was gonna change and evolve as we learned more about the virus and, and what kind of advice made sense to give people. And so, um, you know, that was sort of anyway gonna be a science communication challenge. And I think it's compounded by the fact that it, it's a topic that uh, people feel more confident that they know something about, right? People generally feel like they understand germ theory at a basic level and how to get sick. And so I think that sort of intuitive um, understanding might have also, um, you know, made people more confident in their own their own position on it and um, provided challenges. And then we, of course, added onto that a lot of um, influential people, you know, fighting the scientific consensus and um, a lot of misinformation. And, and of course, communication in that realm is, um, is very challenging. And so, yeah, so I think we, I think we learned the, about the challenge and exactly, you know, how, how we need to get out ahead, try to get out ahead of it the best we can. How do we use effective messengers to ensure that it gets to uh, the people that need that information sooner? And, um, you know, I'm hopeful we'll apply that around, uh, any future challenges that require um, advanced scientific communication rapidly. Yeah, I mean, thanks for that. Uh, it's obviously really hard uh, given everything we've been through and a lot of people think they're experts and we have to consult the experts. And one thing that's, that's uh, to me has been really eye-opening is that, you know, I, as a scientist know that science changes as we get more evidence and we talk about this, but that's often been something really hard to communicate to non-scientists and the public. And I think that's been really, really made very obvious over the course of the last year and a half. And you touched on that. And just how to, how to work on that, I think, is, is a challenge. But hopefully, a lot of people have learned that, even though some people have gone toward the misinformation, a lot of people have learned that, hey, science is changing. We have to, we have to listen to the experts as it changes and take their advice. And so speaking of advice, and you are an expert, uh, we only have a couple minutes left. So I wanna ask a, a final question. So to close out today, what are, what's like one piece of advice or one kind of action that you recommend that attendees and listeners can take today to engage somewhat in science policy, whether they're um, currently a scientist or they're just interested in this field? I would say uh, to uh, get engaged on the uh, societal implications of your science. And that will look differently no matter, depending on where you are. But uh, I have found that to be very eye-opening to see how, uh, what that's, what your science looks like when you're looking at it from the outside. And so as a quick example, when I was in graduate school, I went to go listen to a court case. It was a hearing uh, in downtown Atlanta and it was um, a company that wanted, it was a coal plant that they were going to build and people were challenging whether or not they could build this coal plant uh, on the basis of uh, air pollution emissions. And that, so they were talking very specifically about my, about my research, about atmospheric modeling and exactly what concentrations would be downwind of this plant. Um, and, but the way they were talking about it was completely different than the way that we would talk about it in, in lab group or in a scientific setting. Um, and that really changed my perspective about how how we think about scientific information and how it's communicated and what matters in different contexts. And so uh, I would really encourage folks to think about that and you know what that might look different depending on where your field is, but you know, see how it's communicated in different settings, see who uses it, what are the implications, uh, talk with people who use that information but are not in the on the technical side. Um, and you learn a lot about communication and challenges and gaps and understanding. And uh, I found that tremendously valuable in my career. Uh, I love that story. Thank you for sharing it. Uh, well, it's, it's, we're out of time. Do you have any final remarks after that before I wrap it up? Yeah, thank you all for having me. This was a really great experience. And uh, I hope that, um, I hope that everyone uh, continues in their pursuits and, um, you know, join me on Twitter if you haven't already. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Goldman. Um, this has been a fantastic event. We are out of time. So thank you, Dr. Goldman, for joining us today to share your insights and experiences. I'd also like to thank the audience for your attention and invite you to attend other virtual events being hosted by Rice University and the Baker Institute for Public Policy. For more information on these events, 
You can go to the Baker Institute's website at www.bakerinstitute.org. And meanwhile, I just hope everyone is staying safe and healthy. Thank you so much for enjoying or for joining us this afternoon in this fascinating talk. Everyone take care. <laughs>